Well, hello, dear friends. This is Pastor Mark. Very happy to be with you once again for another Bible reading. I am recording for Friday, the 12th of February, and we've got four wonderful chapters to go through. We've got Genesis chapter 46, Job chapter 12, Mark chapter 16, last chapter of Mark, and Romans chapter 16, the last chapter of Romans. So we're finishing up a couple of books here today. Certainly pray that you and your families have been doing well. Let's, of course, ask the Lord to be a part of this meeting, and indeed the core of this meeting. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm so happy to be with my brothers and sisters once again. I pray that you have brought us through this week well, dear Heavenly Father. Surely it has had its challenges and its difficulties, but as we see through the scriptures, Lord, we shouldn't be surprised when difficulties come upon us. Thank you for holding our hand, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you for having brought us this far, and we have confidence in you to continue bringing us through. As we study tonight, dear Lord Jesus, we want to pray for the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts, to soften us, to educate us, to make us teachable and malleable, that we may be conformed into your image, dear Jesus, just what was intended through the inspiration of the scripture so many years ago, but help it to become alive and new and fresh in us, and may we be the latest testimony of God to our modern day world. We want to pray for every family represented here, dear Lord. We pray for health. We pray for safety. We pray for good relationships, and we pray for faith for all of our households. And please, Lord, if anybody is discouraged, please wrap an arm around them. Help them to know that they are beloved by you. And for any of us who are feeling encouraged, help us to be uh, an encouraging arm around a shoulder, letting someone else know that we love them and you do also through us. Uh, dear Lord Jesus, we just ask for... Uh, wisdom. Oh, and thank you for the promise that you give generously without reproach for anyone who sincerely asks that. We are confident in a blessing today, dear Lord, and we pray it for every person watching this video. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, we start with Genesis 46, and even though this is not one of our chapters in which it's the last chapter of the book, you could say that this is the happy ending at the end of the long saga of Joseph. Uh, Jacob, by this point, has heard that his son is alive, and can you imagine how that conversation must have gone between Jacob's other sons? They had to admit that they had lied to him all those years ago and that uh, Joseph was alive. Could you imagine just the reeling and the disbelief? I can't believe it. Do I dare put my hopes up? But now Jacob is departing, setting out uh, to go down to Egypt. There has been a famine, and it's going to continue for some more years, and so he does need to move. But as he goes, it says, he offers sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. So he is remembering the patriarchs before him, Abraham, Isaac, to whom God had made these promises. And he wants to give a sacrifice, I'm sure, of heartfelt thanks, the deepest heartfelt thanks that he can muster, I'm sure. Uh, God speaks to him, verses 2 and 3. He calls out to him at, in a vision at night, it says. And he says, I am the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again. And Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. That is a beautiful, although a melancholy prophecy, right? Nobody wants to uh, consider their own death, but God is affirming, yes, you're going to die, but it will be your most beloved son who has his hand on your forehead. Closing your eyes. Can you imagine what that meant to Jacob to hear that? Oh my goodness, we're going to have a line here, and I'm going to get emotional tonight. I always get emotional at the end of the story of Joseph. Now here's a question that verse 3 and 4 begs. God can obviously communicate to Jacob when he wants to, and now he's telling him about going down to Egypt and being there with Joseph. But for like 20 years, Jacob thought that Joseph was dead, and God could have told him in a vision... Your sons are lying to you. He's alive and well. I'm protecting him down in Egypt. Why did God not tell Jacob before he found out the natural way from his sons coming to tell him? Um, obviously, he would have loved to have had that piece of information. Would have totally changed his outlook for all those years and decades. We have to trust that in God's wisdom, he knew it was better to have this kind of a resolution than one where he you know, gave away the spoiler at the ending or something. It certainly would have soured Jacob's relationship with his other sons. 
But, uh, you know, this is such a climactic ending. I think we can see how it is worth it. Similarly, you know, that question comes to us. If we have somebody who, say, has a cancer diagnosis or needs surgery, why doesn't God just whisper to us ahead of time the outcome? This comes to the practical level as we consider our own lives. It's, it's easy enough to say, well, but Jacob was fine, so it doesn't matter. As we're going through those valleys of hardship, dear friends, let's consider that the Bible characters also had their very deep and very long valley of sorrow, and God permitted it to happen. Um, so let's not be bitter about it. It's an interesting question to ask, and obviously very practical when we think about our own lives. Uh, but praise the Lord for the good news Jacob is getting here. So verse 5, Jacob leaves Beersheba, which is the southern part of Israel, and Israel's sons took their father Jacob, their children, their wives, in the carts that Pharaoh had sent to transport them. So you can imagine, on the way north, there was this whole caravan of empty carts, right? Uh, is, uh, Egypt is, of course, a wealthy nation. The Pharaoh can, st uh, can spare this stuff. And so these carts are loaded up, I'm sure, with huge joy, laughing, rejoicing. Uh, and then comes a long list of all the descendants, children, grandchildren, wives, you know, all these different things. And it's a long list, and it goes on for quite a bit. And uh, it says at the end that it's 70 people in all. Now here's a fascinating little tidbit. Some ancient manuscripts actually say the number 75 at the end. And so that's just an interesting... Thing, that there's a little wrinkle there that most manuscripts say 70, the, the larger manuscript evidence says 70, but there are a few outliers that say 75. Five people in the, you know, in the scope of this whole thing doesn't make a whole lot of difference, but it's fascinating just to speculate. Maybe it was 75. Moving on to verse 28, they arrive down there and they go to this land called Goshen. Goshen means the land of comfort and plenty, and indeed it was for Israel. It was just what they needed in this time of drought. Now, Goshen is in the north of Egypt. You might remember that the Nile River snakes northward and it stays as a single river until about the last 50 miles, it, it broadens out into an alluvial fan. And that's a very uh, lush, well-watered area there, right up in the sweet spot of northern Egypt. Uh, it says, Joseph had his chariot made ready and went to Goshen to meet his father Israel. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. I don't know how long a long time is, but can you imagine that weeping of the sweet reunification? Oh my goodness, I can't imagine being separated from my father for that long. I looked in a couple of commentaries and uh, they have put together the dates here and there and they've come to be pretty confident that it is 22 years. It isn't stated directly like that in the Bible, but uh, the commentators are confident that it's been 22 years. How long would you hug your parent after 22 years absence, especially the father thinking the child had died? Would you be there for 22 minutes, 2.2 <laughs> hours? I don't know, but they, they wept and embraced with all the emotion that was in them. Israel says to Joseph, now here's again that bittersweet sentiment now I am ready to die, for since I have seen for myself that you are still alive. His soul was, uh, you know, shattered and disharmonious for over 20 years. And he's saying, now I can die in peace. My soul is at peace because I've seen you again with my own eyes. Can you imagine the relief for Jacob? And could you imagine being the son, hearing your father say that? Praise the Lord. Uh, Jacob will keep on living for a bit here. Uh, Joseph says, verse 31, to his brothers and his father's household, I will go up to Pharaoh and I will speak to him on your behalf. And uh, he says, we're going to point out specifically that you are cattle herders. And then the end of verse 34, then you will be allowed to settle in the land of Goshen, for all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. Uh, the Egyptians really looked down their noses. They thought of those people as like dirty people or lesser people. But this is to Israel's advantage because they are not to assimilate with the Egyptians, right? And if they didn't have this detestable job description, they might have been demanded by the Pharaoh to integrate into society. But Joseph makes the special point, I will tell the Pharaoh about your job. And when he comes out, you tell him, make sure to make it prominent about the fact that you are shepherds and cattle herders. Then the Egyptians will leave you alone and you'll be able to live in peace down here. So fascinating. 
All right, so we do still have a few more chapters of Genesis. I believe 50 is the total number of chapters, but this is the big resolution chapter in Joseph's story. We will see just a couple other smallish things, but praise the Lord for that wonderful outcome. Moving now to the book of Job, we are in chapter 12, and Job is still enduring his suffering. We're only about a quarter of the way through at this point. And in chapter 11, which we read yesterday, Zophar has just finished speaking, saying his part in chapter 11. You may remember that uh, I have a Bible here. This is my study Bible that I've had for decades. And I've got green next to Job's sections and orange next to the other sections because I always want to take those things with a grain of salt. So here you can see the ending of Zophar with the orange stripe and then it goes to the green stripe for chapter 12 and chapter 13. Let's see what Job has to say. Now, first of all, what they've been saying has been irritating Job. Look at the sarcasm. This first verse is dripping with sarcasm here. Job replies, Doubtless you are the only people who matter, and wisdom will die with you. <laughs> Can you just hear the, uh, the sharp sting of the tongue there? But I have a mind as well. Don't think me an idiot, right? I'm not inferior to you. Who does not know these things? All the things you've been talking about, I know it. I'm a wise person. Look at verses 4 and 5. I have become a laughingstock to my friends. Though I called on God and he answered, a mere laughingstock, though righteous and blameless. Remember, Job all through this holds up his righteousness. He did not have a secret sin or something that he was keeping private. Uh, verse 5. Those who are at ease have contempt for misfortune. You think that's still true today, friends? You think that the people, say, in the upper half of society look down with disdain on the bottom half of society, not sympathizing with the hardships that they endure? I think that uh, our sinful heart is always tempted to say, well, they must have done something wrong to get in that situation. Here we see a person at the lowest rung of the ladder through no fault of his own. It is Satan persecuting him outside and internally with his body. Uh, verses 7 through 12 is all about nature testifying. Go to the natural places, the animals, the birds in the sky, the earth, the fish in the sea. Uh, the hand of the Lord is evident here. And verse 10, I love this affirmation. In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. The Lord has extended his life-giving breath to us, praise the Lord. Every day we wake up, it is because the Lord continues to give us that breath. And then the scripture says when a person dies, that breath goes back to God and their body goes in the soil. We'll see a few more verses in a couple more chapters about state of the dead theology. Uh, verse 13 and 14 is all about the sovereignty of God. To God belong wisdom and power, counsel and understanding are his. What he tears down cannot be rebuilt. Those he imprisons cannot be released. And Job goes on for several verses here about how God raises some up and how he throws others down, and he does so repetitively and poetically in a lot of different types of aspects. He's really trying to, you know, it's true as you read it, hopefully you experience this, that it deepens the thought. It like makes a deeper impression in your mind when you hear things repeated with synonyms. And the Bible does this plenty, especially here in the book of Job. Uh, interesting little uh, thing I noticed in verse 24, it says, He deprives the leaders of the earth of their reason and makes them wander in a trackless waste. This made me think of King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. Uh, I know that hasn't happened yet in this historical thing, but it just made me think of how God can just so easily take someone's reason. They can be insane, they can be like a brute beast, and then as God pleases, he can put back that wisdom. So, every day that we wake up with our faculties intact, Let's give a word of thanks to the Lord because it didn't have to be so, right? So, uh, Job is going to continue talking through uh, chapter 13 and chapter 14. He's got a three-chapter monologue here, and this is only the first third of it. But continue with us tomorrow and onward. We will see more of what Job has to say. Moving on to the New Testament now, uh, we also get the grand, great conclusion to Jesus' ministry. Thank you, Pastor Nathaniel, for having waded through difficult chapters in Joseph's story, as well as in Jesus's, the closing scenes of Jesus' ministry. I feel like I'm getting all the bread and butter here right now, but let's imagine, put our, our imagination caps on, our mind eye. I, I heard an evangelist once talk about our sanctified Imagination, let's let the Holy Spirit impress us with what these glorious visions must have been like. 
Verse 16, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? So here's a problem that comes to mind. Oh my goodness, we are three women, not too strong. It probably takes at least three or four men to roll this stone. How are we going to do it? But, praise the Lord, the problem is already solved when they get there. Verse 4, they look up, they see the stone, very large, had already been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, verse 5, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe. We, of course, understand this to be an angel, but it's interesting that it doesn't use the word angel, angelos. It's not, it just says a man in a white robe. We do believe it's an angel sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Could you imagine? You're expecting to have a mournful period, uh, uh, putting these spices on the body to uh, preserve it and care for it. And yet, uh, here's this shocking change. Don't be alarmed, he said. <laughs> Funny how the angels always have to say, like, do not fear, calm down. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Now, you and I are familiar with this. We've been hearing about Jesus' resurrection from our childhood. But could you imagine, dear friends, what it would be like to receive news like this for the first time? Frankly, unimaginable that somebody would raise from the dead, right? I mean, it seems impossible, right? But we can only imagine their emotions here. See the place where they laid him, the angel continues. But go tell his disciples and Peter. That might be telling that the angel specifies the disciples and Peter, because you may remember that one of Peter's last actions was to deny his Lord three times. Peter may not feel that he's part of the group of disciples anymore, but the angel wants to specify. Peter is still important. Make sure he specifically gets this message. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Praise the Lord. Go back to the north of Israel, Galilee. Verse 8, trembling and bewildered, the women went out from the tomb. They're having a hard time digesting this. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And that, friends, is the end of the most historical portion of Genesis 16. Can, or sorry, Mark 16. Can you imagine the book ending there that the women, trembling and bewildered, run away and don't tell anyone? Now you're saying, Pastor Mark, what's going on? I've got verses 9 through 20 in my Bible. Yes, but you probably, if you have anything more than just like a basic <laughs> gift Bible, you probably have an asterisk or a line, and it says that verses 9 through 20 are dubious in their historicity because the oldest manuscripts do not have them. In fact, uh, no manuscripts from before about the year 180 have them, and even past 180, it's only a minority that have them. So what do we do about this? It is likely that Mark's original ending was at the end of verse 8. And it is likely that everybody who got to the end of the story said, What? That's it? That's no, that's no ending? <laughs> and probably, especially over the years, people knew the endings to Matthew and Luke and John. And so there's like a PS that is tacked on here, but almost surely by later scribes. In fact, there are two different PSs. Uh, the first short one that I'm going to read is a minority of manuscripts, and then the longer one, which I'll also summarize, is in a greater number of manuscripts. But again, that number only begins to grow more after, like, the year 200. So, the ending A, addendum A, reads like this. It says, uh, this is about the women who ran away and didn't tell anybody. Then they quickly reported all these instructions to those around Peter. After this, Jesus himself also sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Amen. So there is your like two-verse little addendum version A. It puts a nice little cap on it, um, but the more well-known is the addendum B that's quite a bit longer. Here is addendum B. Verse 9, when Jesus arose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. Now this is fascinating because it makes quite a claim here, and this claim is not in any of the other Gospels. Plus, it's in the doubtful addendum. So, I personally believe it. I believe that Jesus drove out uh, demons from Mary Magdalene, but I always keep a little asterisk in my mind on that one because it's just a little bit doubtful historically from the manuscripts. 
Verse 10, she went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Now that is corroborated by at least the Gospel of John. I'll have to check the other two. But uh, that part, absolutely. Verse 12, afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. That little portion there is a brief summary of what we're going to see in Luke. That is a more complete story that's at the end of Luke. Verse 14, later Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating, and he rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after they, he had risen. He said to them, go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So here we see the gospel of Mark's great commission. The Matthew one is very famous at the chapter 28 there, but this addendum also includes a version of it. Verse 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues. That means earthly tongues, by the way, languages. Verse 18, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. So here Jesus gives quite a list of miracles that will accompany the ministry of the disciples, and all of these are attested to in the book of Acts and other places, except one, except for the handling of snakes. Now it's true, Paul accidentally got bitten by a snake and he didn't die. I think he also was given some poison to drink at one point and didn't die. And so people were amazed and surprised and converted because of that. But there's actually a funny phenomenon. I don't know if you've heard of this, but there are churches. I think they're kind of like independent congregational Pentecostal churches in the Southeast that pride themselves in handling snakes and they will pick up snakes in their services, rattlesnakes and other kinds of poisonous snakes because they want to boldly declare this verse to be true. Now, I believe God can do absolutely anything he wants. He obviously saved Paul from a snake. But I don't find anything in scripture that says you should be intentionally picking them up. To me, that sounds like uh, putting the Lord your God to the test. Remember when Satan wanted Jesus to jump down from the 12-story um, uh, temple? Jesus said, no, 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 Satan, we do not put the Lord to the test. So I do not recommend anybody to go out and handle poisonous snakes. Yes, God is able, should you get bitten accidentally, still go to the hospital, please. You know, we don't, uh, we don't pit medical attention uh, as opposed to God's miraculous power. He will work it out. So let's see here. Uh, verse 19, after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his, holy, his word by signs that accompanied it. Now that sounds like a nice capper that finishes off the story very well. Uh, but a couple of things about that. First of all, historically, it is easier to imagine that Mark would have ended it there kind of on a cliffhanger. You ever watched a movie that ends on a cliffhanger <laughs> and it makes everybody gasp at the end? <gasps> Wait, what happens? It's entirely possible that Peter slash Mark just ended it like that, but future scribes and people were so dissatisfied with it that they added the ending. That is easier to imagine than to think that all the scribes early on, except just a couple, had accidentally omitted that, like it ran out of ink and then they didn't get it on there. So it is quite confident that that, that, that last little 11 verses is from like 150 years later. Um, it does feel good. I like that it's there. It certainly makes the gospel feel more complete without it. Here's another problem. The, right, the, the, the voice of the writing feels and sounds very different. In fact, just if you read verse 8 to 9, it, it's, it's like 9 is starting a summary. It, it reads differently. And here's an interesting little manuscript note here. There are eight words in those 11 verses that are used nowhere else in the book of Mark. So you know how people tend to use a certain vocabulary? Uh, you, as you continue reading, you'll probably be able to hear the subtle differences between how Paul expresses himself, and John expresses himself, and Luke expresses himself. Well, Peter and his penman Mark did not use these eight words all throughout the other 15 and a half chapters of the Bible, and yet here in the postscript they used uh, eight new words. Just not terribly likely. I don't mention this to challenge the faith or cause anybody to stumble, but we want to be honest with the parts of the Bible that have just a little bit of a questionable history to them. I don't think we do ourselves any favors uh, intentionally remaining ignorant to those things, because critics will bring it up. Well, what about the end of Mark? We need to be 
aware of and able to speak to that if somebody else brings it up, either as a genuine question or as a challenge to our faith. But, so practically everything we affirm because it's corroborated from other parts of Scripture, the only couple of things that I see that I just keep a little asterisk in my mind is that Jesus drove out seven, seven demons from Mary Magdalene and that uh, handling snakes um, is promised to be non-issue for Christians. So. Okay, let's move on to Romans 16. This also is the last chapter of what can be called Apostle Paul's magnum opus. It's the most complete theological discussion of Christianity and what it all means. And thank you again, Pastor Nathaniel, for having brought us through several chapters of working through the theology on this and the practical applications in the recent chapters. And now most of chapter 16 is personal greetings. I mentioned it a time or two before. Paul is by far the most autobiographical of the New Testament authors. And I'm so thankful he is because he gives us a glimpse into early church life. So yes, there are a lot of names through here. I'm not going to read every name, but we'll mention some significances here. First of all, the first greeting, and generally in Greek, importance is prioritized. It's kind of like the ingredients list on the back of your food products, that the one with the most percentage in the ingredient comes, comes first, and then second, third, fourth, there's smaller percentages. Greek tends to prioritize at the beginning, so it's possible Paul is mentioning the most prominent ones first, and check it out, two of the first three are women. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Chenchere. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a worthy way of his people and give her any help she may need from you, for she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. So his highest regards and highest uh, recommendation goes to this woman named Phoebe. Now the next one is a married couple, Priscilla and Aquila. That may be names that are familiar to us because uh, earlier last month we were reading the book of Acts. And in Acts 18, in the city of Corinth, Paul meets these people. Uh, they, he wants them to get a greeting as well. Verse 4, they risked their lives for me. Paul doesn't forget that. That is big, that they put themselves in danger for the sake of him and for the sake of the gospel. He says, not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also, verse 5, the church that meets at their house. Can you imagine, friends? We're used to coming to, you know, pretty good-sized sanctuary and everything. But the entirety of Christianity was house churches. Can you imagine that little group meeting week by week, loving each other, encouraging each other? A small, tight-knit group. And when the group grew too big, they probably had to go to somebody else's house. Is there anybody here who can offer their house? Because our house is, frankly, getting too crowded. I'll do it. I'll do it. And then there's three, and then there's five, and then there's twelve. Beautiful image of the early church, the purity of faith, the simplicity of breaking bread together. Oh, beautiful. Uh, let's see, then a couple others. Epinetus, first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. He remembers that. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Don't think we have any hint that that's Mary, the mother of Jesus. I didn't look at my, uh, my you know, commentaries on that. But Mary was a very common name. In fact, two of the three ladies who went to the tomb were named Mary, so very common name. Probably not Jesus' mother. Now here's another one. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who've been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. So Paul here is commending a husband and a wife. This is fascinating because it says they are outstanding among the apostles. It sounds like Paul is calling Junia an apostle. And so this is a significant little verse in the idea of like what positions of leadership are permissible for women. It sounds like Paul is calling these folks, and he's saying they even predate me here, sounds like he's calling them both apostles. Now one thing that's fascinating about the name Junia is that in the original language, the Greek, there was no masculine derivation of that name. You know how in English we have like Robert for a man's name and Roberta, Roberta for a woman's name? Another one might be like... Um, well, in Spanish, there's Mario, masculine, and Maria for feminine, right? And a lot of the names have masculine and feminine forms. Same thing was true in Greek. A lot of names had a masculine form and a feminine form, but Junia was one of those names that did not have a masculine form. So there can be no confusion here. Paul is addressing a woman, and it's necessarily a woman, as a fellow apostle. Then we got Ampliatus, verse 8, verse 9, Urbanus. Sounds like he's a city dweller. Uh, I'd have to check how far back the word urban goes. But it made me chuckle because even in the Orange SDA church, we have a couple with the last name Urban. 
So Urbans, this might be like your long distant relative in the past, right? Several other uh, names throughout there, <laughs> latter part of verse 11. Uh, greet those in the household of Narcissus. Narcissus is <laughs> named after the Greek god who was full of himself. I think it was something like he got frozen looking at a reflection of himself in the water. And so fascinating that at this time there was somebody walking around named Narcissus. Uh, we don't have that name anymore because it has a pretty negative connotation. Uh, let's see, other names, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Uh, two women, perhaps sisters, because their names kind of sound like inverted versions of each other. Persis, Rufus, that's an interesting name too. Still around a little bit, I guess. Um, uh, some hard names in, for, in 14 and 15 there. Verse 16, greet one another with a holy kiss. Uh, I, I think of a loving kiss on the cheek, probably is what he meant there. All the churches send their greetings. But he does go into a bit of practical instruction in verses 17 and 18. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. Such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience. I rejoice because of you, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent. Also, some versions say ignorant of what is evil. Verse 20, beautiful piece of good news. God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Sounds like that language back from Genesis 3, right? Being crushed under your feet. Yes. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you, is Paul's desire for the church in Rome. Verse 21 mentions Timothy, his co-worker. We know about Timothy. He shows up in the book of Acts, and we have two letters to Timothy later on. So you can read more about that relationship and how Paul counsels him to be a good minister to the Lord. Uh, verse 22, I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter. Wait, er, stop the car for a second. What is this? Somebody else wrote the letter? Sounds like Paul had a secretary. Uh, Paul, we can infer from a couple other places, might not have had good eyesight. He, of course, was blinded by the Lord and then had the scales removed. Who knows if he bore some long-term consequence of that. In one of the other books, I'd have to look up which one it is, he says, look what big letters I'm writing with as I greet you in my own hand. It looks like at the end of that other letter, Paul picked up the pen to do some writing, but it was big and ugly, probably because the eyesight might have been bad. And so to think that Paul was likely giving dictation and this guy Tertius was writing it down. Some people criticize, for example, they criticize Ellen White for using secretaries. How could a, how, you know, how could a person writing for the Lord use a secretary? Well, here it is. Also, there's other places too. Uh, there's an example in the Old Testament of a secretary as well, doing the writing. Uh, Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, sends you his greetings. Paul is likely staying with him and the ch house church meets in his house. Uh, here's an interesting one, Erastus, who is the city's director of public works. That's a prominent position. Fascinating that he sends greetings along with his brother Quartus. And then verse 25 through 27 is a beautiful benediction. It is an appeal for blessing. And I was thinking as I was reviewing this, why don't we make this our benediction as well? So if it feels appropriate to you, feel free to close your eyes. Let's open our hearts to God as we read these last few verses. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith, to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, that is my prayer for you, that the peace of Jesus, as well as the power of his word, would dwell in your hearts, would influence all that you do, all that you are, and that we could be infused with him so that when we go out the door, it's not just us, it's Jesus in us, through the Holy Spirit, living out his will and his actions, his life. Thank you so much for spending this time together, dear friends. I love you and miss you all. Hopefully it won't be too long before we're able to meet again in the house of the Lord. In the meantime, it's lovely seeing you folks out on the parking lot or the courtyard for the Sabbath morning services. Please greet your families from me and from us at the church. We love you and miss you. Blessings in Jesus' name. Bye-bye.